Hi everyone and thanks for tuning in. In this video we'll be talking about what happened during to life during the Ordovician period which was between 488 and 444 million years ago. The Ordovician follows the Cambrian period in which we see the appearance of most animal phyla in the fossil record. During the Ordovician what we're going to see is a an amazing radiation of those existing animal phyla to begin spreading throughout the ocean. Because as we'll see, throughout the majority of the Ordovician, all of life would still exist in the ocean. However, one of the most amazing advances that will occur in life during the Ordovician is we'll see for the first time that by the end of the Ordovician period, evidence suggests that life will have moved onto land. So stay tuned while we talk about the Ordovician period and how life changed from 488 to 419 million years ago. Hi everyone and thanks for tuning in. During the Ordovician, what we would see is a large adaptive radiation of the existing animal phyla which first appeared during the Cambrian period. Now the extent to which life diversified during the Ordovician is on par with what we saw during the Cambrian. But the main difference is during the Cambrian, in the fossil record we see the first appearance of these higher taxa. We see the first appearance of distinct animal phyla for the first time. What we're going to see in the Ordovician is that these phyla are going to now have species that radiate within them. So we're going to see a more diverse group of mollusks, a more diverse group of echinoderms and arthropods and so on and so forth. Now, if we look at what the Earth actually looked like during the Ordovician period, by and large part, at the beginning of the Ordovician, we are going to see a world that, in terms of its continental organization, isn't that different from the end of the Cambrian. It's going to be a world that exists of several discrete land masses um, spread out across the globe. But by the end of the Ordovician, we would actually see the first steps in the process of the formation of Pangaea. And in fact, some of these changes may have play, played a role in the first mass extinction event that we actually see occurring towards the end of this period. Now, life in the Ordovician wasn't that, at the beginning of the Ordovician, wasn't all that different from the end of the Cambrian. There was no great mass extinction at the end of the Cambrian, and thus the transition from the Cambrian into the Ordovician was a pretty smooth one. One of the things we see if we look at the ocean floor is that uh, the already highly diversified group of trilobites that were present and dominant during the Cambrian are going to be the dominant species on the ocean shelf at the beginning of the Ordovician. However, during the Ordovician period, what we're going to see is uh, other groups are going to start to compete for dominance uh, along that ocean shelf. One of those groups of species would be the brachiopods. Remember the brachiopods are those species that look very similar to uh, uh, bivalve mollusks, except they have the uh, top bottom shell orientation, things like lingula and so on and so forth. So uh, we'll start to see them begin competing uh, for life on the ocean floor as well. We're also going to see the first appearance of reef, beat, build, reef building corals. So remember, corals are nadarians. Uh, the earliest corals that we see during the Cambrian were actually solitary corals. Um, we see very similar species like horn corals and rugose corals uh, later on during periods like the Carboniferous and the Devonian. But the earliest corals during the Cambrian appear to have been solitary corals. When we get into the Ordovician, we're going to see the first reef making corals. And what we're going to see during the Ordovician, which like the Cambrian was a very warm period, we're going to see the uh, widespread existence of large coral networks on the ocean floor, uh, particularly in those warm, shallow seas throughout the majority of the period. We would also see the echinoderms begin to diversify quite heavily during this period. Uh, the echinoderms are broken into several distinct classes of animals, uh, one group being the brittle stars, another group being the sea stars. Uh, they both make their first appearance in the fossil record uh, during this time period as well. We would also begin to see uh, the mollusks begin to radiate quite heavily. So uh, we'll see the first appearance during this period of uh, the nautiloid cephalopods by the end of the Ordovician. We're also going to see a, a rapid uh, diversification within the bivalve class as well as the gastropod class of species uh, during this period as well. And one of the things you're starting to see as all these different phyla begin to diversify heavily, you're starting to see a, 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 an ocean that is increasingly competitive. And one of the things that we do note throughout evolutionary history is when we start to see high levels of competition begin to exist, we're going to start seeing species change quite rapidly because this competition is going to act as a selection pressure. 
So to give you a great example of this, let's look at what happens with the trilobites. So now you have nautiloid cephalopods that are beginning to be a problem. Uh, they are, you know, advanced predator species uh, with, we think at that time, still had um, some increased levels of intelligence. We're starting to see brachiopods, and we're also starting to see the appearance of jawed fish species. So if you remember the astracoderms, uh, which were quite prevalent at the end of the Cambrian, these jawless armored fish, uh, they would be dominant throughout the majority of the Ordovician. In fact, they would also radiate, uh, creating several new species of astracoderms that would help to dominate the water column along with the cephalopod, cephalopod uh, the nautiloid cephalopods. But we're also going to see the first appearance of nathosomes as well. And these are fish that have jaws. And the appearance, the, the first uh, appearance of the hinged jaw uh, in vertebrate life has a tremendous impact on predator prey relationships because now species can eat bigger and bigger food because they have jaws. They can chew, they can tear, they can rip, whereas jawless species don't have the ability to. So, what does this have to do with the trilobites? Well, when we see the diverse group of trilobites during the Cambrian, uh, we see a totally different group of trilobites begin to appear during the Ordovician. And the adaptations we see in this radiating group of trilobites are almost exclusively defensive in nature. We're, we start to see the appearance of elaborate spines. We start to see shovel-shaped uh, you know, shovel snouts. Uh, we start to see head shields. We start to see uh, eye stalks begin to appear. And all of these make sense if you're looking at a species that's un under increasing pressure to defend itself from advanced predators. Because no longer can trilobites simply dominate the uh, they simply dominate the the sea floor. They're under competition, uh, and they're being preyed upon now by advanced predators. Perhaps one of the scariest species to appear during the, first during the Ordovician is a group of species known as the Eurypterids. So the Eurypterids belong to the, in fact, they're the earliest known member of, of the Chalicerate class uh, of arthropods. Uh, these sea scorpions range in size from very small to up to eight feet in length. Um, and were enormous predators that existed in the ocean. And they would all, they're also the evolutionary cousins of all other cholesterates, such as scorpions, spiders, sea spiders, and horseshoe crabs. And what's really interesting is the overwhelming major, majority of the members of this class are actually terrestrial in nature. Now, while many of these wouldn't appear uh, for several millions of years, uh, it is interesting to note that this entire class, uh, this class is heavily balanced towards the, uh, the terrestrial uh, the terrestrial biomes on the planet Earth, and some uh, some data indicates that in fact these might have been the first group of arthropods to actually make it on the land towards the end of the Ordovician. But perhaps the best way to defend yourself from predation is to remove yourself from the environment in which big predators live in the first place. And to look at this, let's see what was happening with plant species. So the warm, shallow seas of the Ordovician were dominated by algae species. And there were lots of different greens and browns and golden algae at this time. But one of the things that we start to see and we have evidence of at the end of the Ordovician is the fact that plant life is gonna make its first movement towards land. Now the fossil evidence for this is it exists, but it's interesting. It's in the form of what we've identified to be uh, plant spores. So spores are something that's only that are only produced by land plants and not by aquatic plants. So for example, algae don't produce spores. They reproduce by forming flagellated sperm, uh, which then swim over, reproduce, and then produce new algal cells in that particular manner. Spores are an adaptation only found in land plants. So the existence of plant spores in the Ordovician strata suggests that plants had already made the leap to the to land by the end of the Ordovician and began evolving terrestrial adaptations. And we do know, based on all of the evidence that we have, that these, these early land plants were the descendants of green algae, particularly the carophytes. Now, the move to land by plants is a very interesting move in, in, indeed. And the main reason why is the movement of plants from an aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment has several disadvantages. So if we think about what algae have going for them by living in the ocean, there are actually lots of benefits to living in the sea. First and foremost is buoyancy. So if you look at algae, and if you ever you know, played with seaweed or seed, seaweed on, on land, it doesn't stand up very well. But if you look at in the water, they, they can reach you know, tens of meters in height from the bottom of the seafloor up in, you know, until it actually breaches the water surface. Why is that the case? Well, it's simple. Water helps uh, because of buoyancy, basically. Water helps to provide structural support that allows these, uh, these species to grow to great heights. Once you move them onto land, there's no longer any water supporting them, and they don't have the ability to resist gravity. Water also is protective in nature. So water actually does a very good job of 
of removing harmful UV rays uh, out of the light spectrum. In other words, it shields plants from the damage that could be caused uh, by the UV radiation. Uh, you know, the, you can actually understand this better if you think about what happens with us. So tanning uh, is a result of UV ray exposure. If you spent an entire day in a pool uh, up to your waist, the upper half of your body would have drastic uh, impact from UV light and would get very tan. If you looked at your legs after that experience, your legs probably wouldn't have tanned at all, and that's because the water has been filtering out all of those UV rays. UV rays also damage your DNA as well, which is why for plants, being able to live in the water, that's highly beneficial because the water is absorbing a lot of those harmful UV rays. Another benefit is it allows for an easy means of reproduction. Aquatic plant species, I should say aquatic algae, reproduce with flagellated sperm. They produce sperm that have flagella, similar to human sperm, that then swim through the water to, their, uh, to the female uh, of the species and or to uh, fertilize a female gamete um, and that allows for fertilization and sexual reproduction to occur through that manner. None of those advantages are in place for species that move on to land. So why then would species move to land in the first place? Well, the first easy example is predation. If there are no land animals at this point in time at the end of the Ordovician and there are not, then there's nothing there to eat them. So if they can remove themselves from the water completely or at least for part of their existence, they are less likely to be predated upon. Another advantage to being a land plant is actually increased accessibility to carbon dioxide and light, both of the key ingredients for photosynthesis. So while the water does a great job of filtering out harmful UV radiation, it also blocks some of the visible light, the light spectrum that's needed for plants to go undergo photosynthesis. So the earliest plants that made it onto land were actually much more efficient in terms of their photosynthesis because they were getting more of the beneficial light rays that they needed to perform their metabolism. They also had more accessibility to carbon dioxide, which is more readily available in the air than it is in the water. Now, of course, these newly terrestrial plants were going to have to undergo some amount of adaptation as they made their life into terrestrial environments. And what we see in all land plants, which are essentially terrestrial algae at this point, we see four key adaptations evolve. And evidence suggests that these, the evolution of these four uh, shared derived traits, if you will, appear at the end of the Ordovician or the very, very earliest part of the Silurian, which is the next period we'll talk about. Those, those four adaptations found in all land plants are as follows. First one is known as alternation of generations. If you look at any terrestrial plant species, you will see that there is both a gametophyte generation and a sporophyte generation. Now, what's interesting in, is in the earliest plant species, the seedless non-vascular plants, these are actually two entirely separate individuals. There is a gametophyte, which produces haploid gametes, and then there is a sporophyte, which is diploid in nature, that produces spores. Those spores go on to give rise to the haploid gametophyte generation, which produces haploid, which goes on to produce haploid gametes, which then fuse to form the diploid sporophyte, and it's just this cycle of gametophyte sporophyte generation. As we get into more modern plants, species like gymnosperms and angiosperms, there won't be two separate individuals. We'll have a single individual that has both a sporophyte, which usually represents the body of the plant, and then the gametophyte, which is typically, uh, for example, in um, in flowering plants. So in the angiosperms is going to represent the flower uh, where fertilization is going to take place. As part of this reproductive process are going to be two of the other four uh, uh, of the uh, the shared derived traits, a gametangium to produce gametes and a sporangium to produce spores. And then the fourth adaptation we see in all land plants is going to be something known as apical meristem tissue. So apical meristem tissue exists in the roots and the shoots of plants and allows them to, uh, to grow by extending their roots and by extending their shoots. It's essentially the growth tissue. All four of these things are the adaptations we see in some form or another in all land plants. And they all appear to evolve during the late Ordovician as plants begin to make their move onto land. And it is indeed the spores that we see in the fossil record of the, of the uh, Ordovician rock strata that help indicate to us that this is about when, uh, when plants made the first move to land. We have hard evidence of terrestrial fully developed plant species during the early Silurian, which we'll talk about in my next video. Now, as I hinted at in the intro, the Ordovician would not end happily. In fact, the Ordovician is gonna end with the first mass extinction uh, that we have uh, in terms of our evolutionary journey, the first of five. So the warm greenhouse climate that held up for most of the Ordovician 
begins to go away uh, towards the end of the Ordovician. And in fact, what appears to happen is a drastic cooling period that's actually going to lead to an ice age. What we see actually is a drastic amount of CO2 begins to get sucked out of the atmosphere. So we can see that there is less CO2, significantly less CO2 at the end of the Ordovician uh, than there is throughout the majority of it. And this is going to end that greenhouse climate and that's gonna result in global cooling, a fairly rapid global cooling process uh, that would result in the formation of glaciers uh, or ice caps at the, both the North and the South Poles. Of course, when we have glaciers, what's gonna happen is ocean levels are going to drop drastically as much of the water gets sequestered uh, at the poles this is going to of course then dry up those shallow seas where life is doing very well so we're going to start to see the end of those coral reef systems that we saw built up during the ordovician and of course we're going to see a, uh, a significant amount of life actually disappear at the end of the ordovician what we'd actually see is somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 percent of all species uh, are going to go away at the end of the ordovician making this one of the most significant mass extinction events in life in life's history on earth what likely caused the Ordovician? Well, there's a significant amount of evidence that suggests it has to do with volcanic activity. Uh, it appears there was a huge uptick in volcanic activity at the end of the Ordovician. This could have resulted in a significant amount of CO2 being sucked out of the atmosphere. This would have then triggered the global cooling event, and this would then change the, uh, the atmosphere of the planet for a significant amount of time. The end result, the end Ordovician mass extinction would be recorded as the second worst mass extinction event in terms of the number of species or the percentage of species on the planet that disappear from the fossil record uh, after this time. Now, life would recover, of course, as we head into the Silurian as the climate restores more towards that warm greenhouse glass, gas climate. So stay tuned uh, for my next video where we'll talk about the the Silurian period and how life recovered from this end Ordovician mass extinction event. As you can see, the Ordovician period was a remarkable point in time for life's history. We start to see the rapid diversification of many of the existing animal phyla, but perhaps most importantly, we see the first movement of life onto land. We see plants that are well adapted for life, or at least beginning to adapt to life uh, in terrestrial environments at the end of the Ordovician. This is going to pave the way uh, for the existence of new species to make their way onto land during the next period, the Silurian. In our next video, we'll talk about the Silurian and how life rebounded from the end Ordovician mass extinction event during this time period. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in. I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye.